You said that 15 times more glyphosate is being used compared to before GMOs were introduced. Why is that happening and what impact does that have on people? There are two reasons why there's more glyphosate. Monsanto actually started genetically engineering crops in order to maintain a stranglehold on the sales of glyphosate-based herbicides, which was Roundup, because their patent for glyphosate was expiring in 2000. So they created Roundup-ready crops engineered to be sprayed with Roundup. And when the farmers bought the seeds, they signed a contract that they had to buy Monsanto's version of their glyphosate-based herbicide or one of their licensees. So they maintained a hold on much of the market and now the farmers are spraying Roundup over the tops of the entire field. Most of the soy, over 90% of the soy and the corn and the canola and the cotton are genetically engineered and most of that is Roundup ready meaning that it's sprayed. So the Roundup is now increased because of the acreage of the Roundup ready crops and the ability to, for the farmers to spray over the entire field, not just a spot spray. And that has increased the overall exposure of the Roundup and its chief poison glyphosate in the environment. And so now the weeds have outsmarted Monsanto and developed resistance. And so that means that the farmers are using more and more concentrated versions of Roundup with higher levels of glyphosate. And so between those two, that, that's substantial. Adding to that, about 15 years ago, Monsanto started to advertise that farmers could spray Roundup on crops just before harvest to cause quick ripening of grains and to dry down the grains and kill off all the weeds in preparation for next year. Same with the beans. And so now they're using it as a desiccant to dry down the crops three to five days before harvest, which again, more glyphosate, more Roundup. And so now all those reasons have resulted in a massive use of glyphosate. And now you can find glyphosate in 60 to 100 percent of the air samples and rain samples in the Midwest. How is the environment affected by GMOs? You said if you introduce a GMO into the environment, the genes become a permanent feature of the gene pool. It gets passed on generation after generation. The only thing that lasts longer than a contaminated gene pool is extinction. Can you explain that at all in greater detail? Well, imagine if you released genetically engineered corn and it cross-pollinates with non-GMO corn and then that seed becomes planted, et cetera, et cetera. Every single season, you have some level of contamination. With canola, same thing, but canola is in the brassica family, so that can cross with the brassicas like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. How are you going to recall the genes in the gene pool? This is a situation where we're creating new organisms that are not the products of the billions of years of evolution. Instead, they're the products of laboratory practices whose number one most common result is surprise side effects. And we're releasing it into the environment where it can irreversibly replace nature and corrupt the gene pool. Now, this was really bad in the very beginning, even when they only released a handful of GMOs. Consider now that gene editing is so cheap and so easy that individuals and companies all over the planet will be targeting anything with DNA in the hopes that they can come up with some kind of innovation to make money or gain greater control or ease. Now we're talking about genetically engineered bacteria, fungus, algae, insects, animals, plants, trees, grass. They literally could replace nature. Now what could go wrong? Anything in the 1990s they nearly introduced a genetically engineered bacteria that turned cellulose, plant matter, into alcohol. And they wanted to release it to farmers to mix with their crop stubble so they wouldn't have to burn it at the end of the season. And it would turn to alcohol so they could run their tractors. Then they were going to be instructed to take the sludge at the bottom of the barrel and spread it on their field. They were two weeks away from releasing the bacteria in an experiment just to see how far it spread. Well, the EPA actually did an experiment to see how far 
genetically engineered bacteria spread. And according to Elaine Ingham, a professor and doctor who was given the information privately by someone from the EPA, their study showed that the, the bacteria was spread all around the world within a few years, all over the world. So they were about to spread, they were about to release, with EPA approval, this genetically engineered bacteria. It's called Klebsiella planticula. And it was going to be released just to see how far it spread. And then they were going to send it out to farmers so that they could use it to create alcohol and spread the sludge on their, on their land as fertilizer. Two weeks before it got released, Elaine Ingham's graduate student, she was the advisor, came into a lab where he had taken that sludge and put it in with soil as part of his study that he was going to do to get his PhD and noticed that all of the wheat seeds and, and little plants had turned to slime, to mush. Because when he spread the sludge onto the field, it turned the plants into alcohol, killing them. And when I asked Dr. Elaine Ingham, what would that have meant if they released it in the environment? She said it could mean the end of terrestrial plant life. The end of terrestrial plant life, where we grow most of the food to feed humans. Because this particular genetically, this particular bacteria was found all over in every single plant that they tested. But if this new variety could have pushed out the natural variety because it would have turned things to alcohol, the alcohol would have killed the natural variety, but not the GMO variety. And so it would have replaced its natural parent and overtaken its role in nature and killed the terrestrial plant life, the roots, etc. So this was a near cataclysm, two weeks away from happening. And it wasn't the first time. In the 1980s, they nearly released genetically engineered bacteria that was to replace bacteria that causes frost to form. They wanted to protect the strawberries and the potatoes from damage from the frost. And what this bacteria does is that not, not only turns uh, precipitation into frost at much higher temperatures than would otherwise occur, it condenses water in clouds. It creates snow. And what if they release this genetically engineered bacteria and it took over and it out survived the natural version and ended up airborne, it could have changed the weather patterns on the planet. Now those are two bacteria that were almost released widely. Now you can do genetically engineered bacteria through CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing. You can buy a kit, do-it-yourself kit, for 160 bucks. And you can flush your bacteria down the toilet and have an environmental release. Or you can buy a lab and build it for $2,000. Or if you're Monsanto, now Bayer, you can have, in fact, buildings full of robots driven by artificial intelligence to produce massive outputs of gene-edited GMOs. We're talking about the possibility of replacing nature, eliminating the products of the billions of years of evolution, and replacing it with accident-prone new versions that are unrecallable and irreversible. And when I talk about corrupting the gene pool, that's what happens to the individual plant. So you have mouse genes that were gene edited. The, the gene editing mechanism cuts the double-stranded DNA, and the cellular mechanism for the, for the mouse rejoins them. But it can grab DNA from the environment, meaning the Petri dish that has uh, cow or goat serum so we now find gene-edited mice that have retroviruses that were taken from cows or goats. We had hornless cattle that were created because they wanted to stuff more cattle into factory farms. So they took out the gene that created the horns. And they said, this is so safe and so predictable and such a perfect gene edit that there should be no regulation on gene-edited animals ever again. And they were breeding these for release in Brazil. And then the FDA came along and decided to sequence the actual genome and went, guess what, guys? You made a mistake. There's bacterial genes inside the cows now in every cell. 
In fact, there's antibiotic resistant genes. These genes, if, if they were released in cattle, could create antibiotic resistant diseases, which could cause death and unnecessary amputations. So we have genetically engineered bacteria, genetically engineered animals. We, have, we could have gene edited anything. And these unpredicted side effects could cause a catastrophe. We know what it's like when we have a single invasive species that grew in harmony with its environment, but when transferred to a new location, creates chaos. Imagine taking an ecosystem and replacing it all with gene edited alterations, where you never quite know what's going to happen. It's a chance, <laughs> the chances of a catastrophe are near 100%. The chances of a cataclysm is something I don't even want to think about. 